Let's pray. <laughs> I need to pray to get us started. Um, Father, thank you for this time that we have in your word. Thank you for um, the way you met so many of us so powerfully on Saturday. It was so incredible to be in your presence in that way. I pray right now that you will pour out your spirit into our presence here, that you will grant us wisdom and knowledge as we study your word, that you will grant us all deep insight into your word. And I pray that you allow me to teach only what is true, that we will um, grow collectively together closer to you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so ladies, back to Genesis. We are going to go through Genesis 21 through 23 today, which is really the story of, we're going to focus on the story of Abraham and Isaac and his almost sacrifice of Isaac. Um, so just to kind of, since we haven't been here for two weeks, to kind of get us back into context, um, we are doing the overview of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, which is called the Law, the Writings of Moses, the, uh, the Law of Moses by Jesus and the Apostles, and then called the Torah by those from Jewish background. And we've asked the question, why do we study the Pentateuch? And you ladies can give me the answer. We study the Pentateuch because it's about who? It's about Jesus. Yes, that's I like to say that's the Sunday school answer. If you're ever in doubt, just say Jesus. That's the answer. Um, so Jesus says the law of Moses and the writings of Moses are about him and that he has fulfilled everything written in the law of Moses, everything written in the Pentateuch. So why do we read the Pentateuch? It's about Jesus. And the goal of this class is to look for Jesus in the Pentateuch. And today we will look for him and find him, which is going to be a lot of fun. Some amazing imagery today. Okay, so... Um, we want to see how the kingdom of God established in Genesis is fulfilled in Jesus. So, so far in this class, we've looked at creation. We asked, what does it mean to be image bearers of God? And uh, for those of you who are here on Saturday, I hope you were happy to be able to be my uh, pop quiz answers. Because I, I sh kind of shared with everyone um, as we're looking at what does it mean to be image bearers of God? What does it mean to, be bo to bear God's image? It's two W's, right? It's first we are given what about our identity? We're given worth, exactly. And then the, we are given a job to do. We are given work, exactly. So bearing God's image means we are given worth and we are given work. Um, so we've seen the, the God covenanted with a certain family, beginning with Adam and his descendants. We've seen God choose by grace Adam's descendants through Abraham to continue this covenant. And it starts with that call. For God simply tells Abraham, follow me. And I think and all of us ladies have probably had that moment in our lives where we have heard that call, that follow me. And we don't always know where we're going, just like Abraham. He didn't know where he was going. He was just leaving Ur. But that's the call we have, all have in our lives. Follow me, no matter where it leads. So um, God says, if you agree to be faithful to me alone, I will covenant with you. And we get the promise of the three things. You can see I like um, my alliteration. So <laughs> our three Ps, you can shout them out. What, are he, what is covenanted with Abraham and his descendants that they will have? What's one of the Ps? Throw it out. Promise, exactly. The promise that the whole world will be blessed through Abraham's descendants. And then there's two more. There's... Progeny, exactly as many descendants as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. And then the last P is place, exactly. The land of Canaan will be an inheritance forever if they will be faithful and believe. So God says that this promise of progeny will be biological and not adoption. That through the, though Abraham is an old man already when he's called at the age of 75, the promise will be realized through Abraham's body, not through his adoption of another heir. Uh, last session, we saw how Abraham and Sarah got kind of antsy. Remember that? And they decide that God needs a little help in acting his plan, which does God ever need any help? No. So they decide that, so Sarah has this grand idea Let's use your servant, our servant Hagar, that we picked up in Egypt. She's young. She's fertile. Let's, let, let's make her do the work. So um, Hagar gets thrown into the mix and son Ishmael is born. Uh, but this is not God's covenant plan. This is a challenge to the covenant. Uh, thankfully, God's plan occurs despite our crazy attempts to make it happen. And, uh, but there is fallout. 
as we talked about last time, the descendants of Ishmael, which are those, um, those of Islamic faith, claim themselves to be descendants of Ishmael, um, are still at war with the descendants of Isaac, those of Jewish faith. Um, so it's amazing to see that that fallout still reaches us today. As a descendant, uh, so as God, then God visits Abraham and Sarah in that really interesting theophany, we call it. It's a big theological word for the presence of God. That theophany were two angels and this figure that appears to be God in human form come and visit them. This is called possibly a Christophany or an appearance of Christ, an encounter with the pre-incarnate Christ. I'm throwing out big theological words, but you ladies can handle it. Um, So they meet with Abe and Sarah and they tell them not to doubt the plans of the Lord. That Genesis 18, 14 says, for anything or is anything too hard for the Lord? And that's a question we can ask in our own lives. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. So in this interesting theophany, the Lord tells Sarah that she will have a son. And do you remember, ladies, what's her response when she hears? What does she do? She, she laughs. Exactly. Now, this is not like a yay, happy me laugh. This is a laugh of what? What would you say? Of, of shock, but of also maybe unbelieving of disbelief, of doubt, exactly. This is not joy laughter. This is doubt laughter. This week, we will see the promise of this son born, but then we'll also see the unthinkable occur where God will ask Abraham to sacrifice this promised, long-expected son. And I know this story makes us really uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable, I will be honest, but I will try to unpack it the best that I can. Uh, And remember, we have to always look at these stories through the lens of Moses. What does Moses want the Israelites to learn through these stories? Because as I've been mentioning, I'm sure there were a lot of oral stories in the early Israelite tradition, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these are the stories that are recorded for us. So why? What are we to learn from these stories? So today we're going to do an overview of Genesis 21 through 23, and again, continue to focus on the covenant as our unifying theme. Um, Let's start with a super fast reminder of the context of Genesis, since again, it's been a few weeks. Um, So ladies, who is our author? You can shout it out. It's Moses. Thank you. Uh, We know we, even though he's never, never identifies himself, we know that he's qualified. He's an eyewitness. The Lord commands him to write down the words of his words, and both the Old and the New Testament attribute the Pentateuch to Moses. So that's internal evidence. Uh, who? Who was Genesis written to, ladies? It was written to the Israelites, exactly. Um, and this is really important because we remember this written to a nomadic Semitic group 3,500 3, years ago. Genesis was not written to us, but it was written. For us, exactly. So it's written to a certain people at a certain time with a certain knowledge and worldview with the greater intention of communicating God and his covenant to the future generations. So when is it written? Approximately 14, at least before 1406 BC, as we believe that's when Moses dies. What is what type of writing is Genesis? And the phrase I've thrown out to you, ladies, is it's theological history. And this comes from Professor John Walton of Waden. Theological history. Moses writes real history to teach theology. He chooses events and stories to teach us about who God is and who we are in relationship to him. So the story of Genesis is the story of God creating a kingdom, pushing back the darkness and the chaos, revealing himself to certain people to create his kingdom on earth. And then why? Why is it written? Well, it's written to teach the Israelites the theology of who God is and his purposes, which is radically different than the cultures around them. So, and as I've said before, to do a a whole study of the Pentateuch would take us all year. So again, we are going to be um, focusing on pieces of our chunk of scripture today and not reading every single word. So to connect... um, And really looking again at the idea of covenant. Covenant is the unifying theme of Genesis. So Sarah laughed out loud when she was told she would have a child at the age of 90. A year later, she will again laugh again, but it's a different kind of laughter. So because the Lord 
always keeps his promises. So let's start in Genesis 21, 1 through 6. You can turn your Bibles to Genesis 21, ladies. Okay. 1 through 6. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah will nurse children yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So in this, we see the power of God's word and his promises that creation happens because God speaks it into being. Look at how this miracle occurs. I love the language. First one, the Lord is gracious to Sarah as he had what? As he had said as he had said, he said that he would make this happen. The Lord is gracious to Sarah as he had said and did for Sarah what he had, what? What he had promised. Did for Sarah what he had promised. God had said, God had promised. And Sarah bears a son, verse two, at the very time God had, do you see it? Had promised, exactly. That why, so again, ladies, thinking through the lens of Moses, why would Moses focus on these words as he writes the Pentateuch to the Israelites? That as they're about to enter Canaan, as they're about to try and conquer it, what promise would they be relying on of the three Ps? They've been promised, this has been passed down to them through the covenant to Abraham as they're about to go into the land of Canaan, what P promise are they going to be relying on? That they are going to be having what? Their place. Exactly. The promise of place is before them, but they have not yet gained it. They do not yet own or dwell in Canaan. It's only a promise to them. So we see that Moses is saying, when God says it, it will happen no matter what. As God had said to Sarah, you will have a child at the age of 90. He fulfills that promise. So if he had promised this to the Israelites and they are to faithfully walk forward in that promise, what would be the result to the Israelites? What could they expect? That they would do what? That they would would conquer Canaan. That they would be able to dwell in it because that promise had been given to them. So, because there's anything too hard for the Lord. That's the phrase we need to remember. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah bears Isaac at age 90. And what is her response? What does she do? She laughs. Exactly. But this is a different kind of laughter, isn't it, ladies? What kind of laughter is this laughter? It's joy. Exactly. It is no longer doubting laughter. It's joyful laughter. Don't you get the sense that this laughter is so different? It's only been a year in her life but she laughs entirely differently. She laughs because who would have told her that she would actually have a son at this age? It's laughter of joy. And what will the others around Sarah also do? What does it say? They also will laugh with her and share her joy. This is a 90-year-old woman, ladies, who probably had felt worthless in many ways, who had felt that she had failed as a wife, not producing an heir for Abraham. Abraham was a very powerful man by this time in Canaan, and yet he had no heir. He had no one to pass his fortune, his wealth to. And as a woman, she probably would have felt that that was the one job that she was supposed to do, right? The one thing she was supposed to do is create and produce an heir for this man. And she hasn't been able to do that. She... So Sarah has likely felt like a failure, for her entire life up until this point. And here she is, miraculously at 90, having a baby. So she laughs at the joy of experiencing God's incredible love for her in this moment. And because she now knows that if the Lord says it, nothing can stop it. 
Look at how they have learned faith through walking with God. We need to hear that as well, ladies, that God's promises to us will happen. Like with Elizabeth, for those of you here, here at the one day on Saturday, God was setting up the stage to do the miraculous by having her be barren for so long. So what is Abe, what is God teaching Abe and Elizabeth through Isaac? You can throw out some answers to me. What is he teaching them through this encounter? Patience, absolutely. What else? Trust, trust no matter what, exactly. Yeah, faith. He's teaching them faith, exactly. To trust him, to walk with him, that when he gives them a promise, it will happen. So if we then go to the big picture, then what does Moses then want the Israelites to learn through this story? You can just throw out some answers to me. What does he want them to learn? Same thing, patience, faith, exactly, trust, hope, walking with him. He will fulfill his promises to them. So um, do you ladies actually know what the name Isaac means? Anyone? Laughter. Isaac means he laughs. So he's named the child of laughter, the child of joy, a reminder that God fulfills his promises. Isaac is the walking reminder that God fulfills his promises. All right. Well, now that we've got an heir for Abe in Isaac, there's going to be some strife between Hagar and Sarah. Abe has an heir in Ishmael, a son he has raised. Abe was 86 when he had Ishmael, and he's now 100. So the boy is 14. He's been the father to Ishmael for 14 years. He loves this boy. He is Abe's firstborn and therefore has the inheritance rights. But he was born to a slave in the household. So what's going to happen? So we'll pick up our story, Genesis 21, verse 8. The child grew and was weaned. This is Isaac. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, so she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. And we remember that Hagar is an Egyptian. All right, so Abe throws a big party when Isaac is weaned, um, which actually could have been when the child is two or three. Weaning occurred much later back then than we wean now. Ishmael is probably now somewhere in the range of 15 to 17 years old, and he's mocking his baby brother, literally actually laughing at. It's so interesting how this wordplay of laughter continues to be used for this story. So he's laughing at him, but in this kind of mocking kind of laughter. Uh, The word is, uh, I'm afraid I'm just going to butcher it. Um, It's written on your cheat sheets. It's (laughs) mesahek, mesahek. I'm, I'm not saying that right. We need a Hebrew scholar. Okay. Um, but you see that wordplay. The son of laughter is being laughed at. He's being mocked. Uh, we really see two protective mama bears in the story coming out. Uh, Sarah is protective over Isaac. She wants him to take his place as the rightful heir. Um, Hagar also wants to protect and elevate her own son, Ishmael. 
Abe is caught in the crossfire because we're sure that he loves Ishmael, the son of his. But God tells him it's okay to let Ishmael go. He'll make him into a great nation. And um, through Isaac, the covenant will occur. Um, the promises of progeny, place, and the entire world being blessed are going to come through Isaac. That's the promise. Now, it's interesting. This is actually not the last we will see of Ishmael. He doesn't entirely disappear. Genesis 25, 9, Isaac uh, and Ishmael together bury Abraham, their father, which is interesting. Um, Genesis 28, 9, Isaac's son Esau actually goes to Ishmael's family to find a wife, Mahalath. And then in 36.3, Esau then again marries another one of Ishmael's daughters, Basemath, which is interesting. So he doesn't entirely disappear. Genesis 37, remember the 10 older sons of Jacob who sell Joseph? Do you remember who they sell them to? It's the Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt. So it's very interesting. So Ishmael does go off into the desert, but he really becomes still a powerful man. Um, Ishmael stays present, um, but he does not share in the inheritance of Isaac. Yet in grace, he is still cared for by the Lord. Um, the following verses depict Abe and King Abimelech entering into a treaty. It shows actually what a great man Abe has become in Canaan and depicts how others see the hand of God in his life. See him blessed. Abimelech actually approaches Abraham. So Abimelech is a king, but he approaches Abraham about forming a treaty with him. Um, Abe doesn't approach Abimelech. So I'm just going to read a, a couple verses just to highlight sort of the point of that passage. So Genesis 21, just actually verse 23. So Abimelech comes to Abraham and says, Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me and the country where you now reside as a foreigner the same kindness I have shown you. So how do you think Abimelech feels about Abraham? If he's coming to him for a treaty, what do you ladies think? He's, Abraham is powerful. Yeah. And what was that? I heard. What did you say, Liz? I think I heard you. Yeah. He's fearful of him. Exactly. Abimelech is actually afraid of Abraham, which shows, again, exactly what a powerful man he's become. So, again, let's think big. Why would Moses include this story for the Israelites? Any thoughts, ladies? The power, yes, the power and the influence of Abraham. It's showing that I think the message is to the Israelites, follow me, be faithful to me. You too will be blessed and the nations around you will notice that your blessing will be so great that others will see it. So, because Abimelech clearly saw the hand of God on Abraham's life. All right, so now we turn to the story of Abraham and the almost sacrifice of Isaac. Um, it's a powerful story, and we'll walk through it slowly. Let's start with just verses 1 and 2. So chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Mount Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Let's start there. Okay, so what do we learn about God, how God views this command in verse one? He views it as a what? As a, do you see it? As a test. He views it as a test. So the Hebrew word nasa means meaning to put someone to the test to prove someone or something. The command seems ludicrous, doesn't it? That God has made a covenant with Abraham. He's told him the covenant will unfold through Isaac. He's told him that. Now God is commanding Abraham to sacrifice the son. Child sacrifice was practiced in the ancient Near East, but was considered abhorrent to God. Moses, our author here of Genesis, also records God's commands about child sacrifice in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And I have some scriptures for you, ladies. 
It's Deuteronomy 12, 31. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abominable thing the Lord hates they have done for their gods for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. So he's talking about the other nations of Canaan around the Israelites. Leviticus 20, 1 through 5, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, um, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. So again, that's something that the other nations practice, not the Israelites. Deuteronomy 18.10, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns the son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer. Then there's more from the later prophet Jeremiah says that child sacrifice is entirely against the very nature of God. Jeremiah 32, 35, they built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch, though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind. I love that. Nor did it enter into my mind. The Lord would never desire this kind of thing, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So God hates child sacrifice. It would never even enter into his mind. But here, God asks Abe to do it. So the question is, why? And what will Abe do? Will he say, no way, not the precious child you promised me and gave me. So let's see how Abraham responds. Genesis 22, 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here. Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. So how does Abe respond? Verse three, does he wait a couple weeks? What does he do? He responds immediately. He does. Early the next morning, he takes Isaac, two servants, a bunch of wood, and he sets out in the direction that God tells him to go. They travel for three days. We notice that Isaac must be quite a bit older at this point. He walks for three days. When they arrive at the mountain, who carries the wood in verse six? It is Isaac, exactly. So Isaac is clearly older. He now carries the wood for the burnt offering, not his elderly father. So when they arrive at the mountain, notice what Abe says to the servants. Verse five, he says, stay here, then who will return? He says, we, we will return. Abe has been told to sacrifice Isaac, but he says he and the boy will return. Isaac has been kept in the dark about the plan. As they head up the mountain, he says, Dad, we've got fire and wood. Where's the lamb that we sacrifice? And how does Abe respond? Verse eight, who will provide the lamb? God, God himself will provide the lamb. So Genesis 2, 22, 9 through 18. We'll continue with the story. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have, you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. 
Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. All right, so Abe and Isaac climb up Mount Moriah. Abe binds Isaac, which we think Isaac could easily have resisted at this point. He's an older boy. If he's old enough to carry the wood, he's old enough to resist his father. He's definitely old enough to fight him off. But what does Isaac do? He does what? He, he submits. He trusts. He lays down on his own accord. As Isaac, beloved son, lies there, Abe takes the knife and raises it. And God yells, stop. Stop. I won't require this of you. It's too much. But now I know your heart. What does God confirm about Abraham's character? Verse 12, Abraham fears God. He has not withheld his one and only son. In our minds, we think of fear as like dread or like terror, like a scary movie, you know. But fear of God is different. It's this awe-inspiring reverence. This fear is the reaction of coming face to face with God with the creator of the entire universe who speaks it into being. It's the awareness of our total unholiness and God's total holiness. When we put our unholiness next to God's holiness, this awe should be our reaction, this sense of holy fear of our total depravity and God's total perfection in comparison, of being in the creator of the, in the presence of the creator of everything, the author of salvation, we fear the one who controls the winds and the waves and we measure our lives against God's total perfection, his holiness. Awe-inspiring reverence should be our response to God. And then gratitude for his love for us, that he could destroy us if he wants to. But his love to us comes through grace, not by anything we have done, not by anything we will do in the future. Hebrews 11 actually provides more perspective on Abraham. Let's turn to Hebrews 11, ladies, verse 17. This is called the hall of, hall of faith sometimes, all about the great heroes of faith. So Hebrews 11, chapter 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So verse 18 here. What does Abe believe about Isaac? What does he believe about the covenant that through Isaac, it will happen? Exactly. He believes that through Isaac, the covenant will be enacted. Verse 19, what does Abe therefore reason that God could do, that he could do what? He could raise the dead. So he believes in his whole heart, this covenant is going to come through Isaac. So if God is telling him to do this, then that must mean that God is going to raise the dead. Because God has told him two things, and God's promises always happen. So, does Abe believe God is going to permanently kill Isaac here? No, he doesn't, actually. He told the servants both he and Isaac would return, right? And Abe believes that God's word to him, he believes God's word to him, and he can walk forward in faith, no matter how crazy the request seems. Abe has seen God's word come true in the birth of Isaac. He has learned faith through obedience in his life. So he can walk forward in faith now, trusting God wholeheartedly. All right, back to Genesis. So let's turn back to Genesis 22. Okay, so now instead of Isaac, God substitutes a sacrifice that he provides. God provides the sacrifice. What is caught in a thicket or some bushes 
nearby, a ram, exactly, a lamb. Abe sacrifices the lamb in place of Isaac. And what does he call the place? He calls the place what? The Lord. The Lord will provide. Exactly. This is a prophetic word, ladies. Do you know what else will be provided on this very same mountain? Mount Moriah, this mountain, is the place where Solomon builds his first temple. It becomes the location of Jerusalem. And when the Israelites return from exile and build the second temple, they build it on the exact same spot. Ladies, in what city is Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Jesus is crucified on this exact same mountain, ladies, where Abe is almost sacrifices Isaac. Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is not Abe who will sacrifice his son. Who will sacrifice his son? God. God is the one who sacrifices his son. At Jesus' baptism, God names him as his son. Matthew 3, 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus is the son who is sacrificed. Jesus is the substitutionary sacrifice that covers over all of our sin. God provides the lamb. He provides the way for us to be in an intimate relationship with him. God initiates it. When I think about my own life, there's no way I deserve God's love for me. I feel like my failings are always before my eyes. You ladies probably feel like that too, right? That daily I struggle to give my husband the warmth and the love that he wants from me. You know, daily I struggle to be patient with my kids, to guide them with patience, to correct them with grace. Oh gosh, it's so hard. This past Saturday and, and evening and Sunday after the women's one day, I had this really, this huge sense of being overwhelmed by God's love for me. I don't think I'm anything important. Yet to see the way he works through me is incredibly powerful. It's by grace. It's not by anything that I have done. So we recorded the live stream in the fellowship hall, and I was walking, watching it back, and I was literally watching it going, is that me? <laughs> really? I mean, I sound pretty good, actually. I sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But I don't feel that way inside of me. I feel constantly as a sinner saved by grace. The authority I feel walking in God's path for me is only from him. It's only authority that comes because of his authority on me. I know I don't deserve to be there. It is by grace that he gives me the ability to teach you ladies, to speak to women, to teach his word. And I feel overwhelmed with gratitude for that mercy and that grace in my life because I have not been a perfect Christian my whole life. I have walked through my own sin and my own pain. So, and to be able to work with the amazing women that God brought together to create the event, it just make, it made me teary-eyed and thankful. I felt like just the fullness of God's incredible love. So none of us deserve God's love. None of us deserve Christ's substitutionary sacrifice for us. So at the end of this account in Genesis, God reiterates his covenant with Abraham. Again, seeing the blessing of descendants of progeny, of Abe's descendants taking possession of the cities of their enemies or place. And through Abe's offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed. So all three of those promises are reiterated too. A promise realized through Jesus alone. And we see that, um, that all of this, that Abe does not earn his righteousness, he walks in faith, and that it is simply through faith. There's actually, um, Romans 4 talks about it, and I didn't honestly have this in my original notes, so let me see if I can find it quickly. But I was listening, I was thinking more about it and listening to something this morning that was talking about, so let's see if I can find it quickly. All right, Romans 4, 18. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, as he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, 
that he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Credited to him as righteousness by faith. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone. This is, this is the, the key point I really wanted us to think about. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, the church. To whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sin and was raised to life for our justification. So it was credit to him as righteousness. And what I love about this is it said, this was not just written for him, but it was written for us as well. That this story of Abraham is written for us. That we would see Christ as the son that was sacrificed, the substitutionary sacrifice, not um, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So... um, I think, though, one, when we read this story, there is one thing that really strikes us in an uncomfortable way. What would you ladies say that is? What is so uncomfortable about, that, about this story? To me, I think it's the idea of test. Does that strike you ladies as uncomfortable in any way? That why, why don't we like the idea of God testing Abraham? Because if God knew he wasn't actually going to sacrifice Isaac, it was a test. How do you ladies feel about that? Why don't we like that? Because you could fail. That's true. We could fail. It was a teaching tool for Abraham to learn about himself and God's faithfulness. Yeah. It's an example to us of the strength of faith that Abraham carried, that he believed this promise would happen through Isaac. <laughs> Where's Sarah doing all this? Clearly in the dark, because we don't know if she would have gone through with it. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't tell her. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's really hard to do his will. Yeah, totally. Um, Sandy, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, do, your question is, did Abraham realize it was a test? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, he knew that 